Welcome to SATCONS 101, an educational activity of the International Astronomical Union's Center for the Protection of the Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference, or CPS. This activity aims to promote factual understanding of large satellite constellations in order to help participants come to reasoned and informed opinions about this important social and technological issue. Today's topic is legal and policy considerations. The Center's mission is to coordinate efforts and unify voices across the global astronomical community with regard to the protection of the dark and quiet sky from satellite constellation interference. My name is John Berentine, and I co-lead the Community Engagement Hub of CPS. My training is in optical and infrared astronomy. And my current professional work involves freelance consulting. Since 2019, I have worked on policy and advocacy issues around large satellite constellations. I will present to you on today's topic. These are the learning objectives of the SATCONS 101 curriculum. Participants will gain exposure to these ideas in the course of viewing all of the presentations in the series. Opportunities to learn more about any given topic will be offered in each module, as well as to contact the Center for further information. SATCONS 101 is a series of learning modules covering eight broad subject areas. Each module is a short, self-contained video presentation covering one of the subject areas. They can be viewed individually or in any combination up to the full set. Viewing all eight presentations constitutes exposure to the complete SATCONS 101 curriculum. Today, we will focus on the topic of legal and policy considerations. In the next few minutes, I will discuss each of the following elements that relate to the topic of this video. The space age began about 65 years ago with the launch of the first artificial satellite. As countries launched more satellites into space, it became clear that some governing rules were needed. Several years of negotiations in the international community led to the adoption of the United Nations Outer Space Treaty in 1967. This treaty consists of a few high-level ideas about the human use of outer space. These include space as the province of no specific country and free for exploration by all, a prohibition of nuclear weapons in space, and making countries responsible for the actions of spacecraft launched from their territories. Other policies, like allocating the uses of the radio spectrum, are controlled by a similar process of international cooperation. Among other goals, this approach aims to make the shared resource of outer space available to all. It further sets up an organization called the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space to help settle disputes among nations. To date, 112 countries have adopted the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty, they use the treaty as the basis for their own national space policies governing the launch and operation of spacecraft. Those policies become the basis of detailed regulations that apply to the details of space activities. Most countries also establish formal oversight bodies to ensure that their actions are consistent with their treaty obligations. Any country that ratifies the Outer Space Treaty may set national space policies that are more strict than what the treaty requires. But it establishes a minimum set of principles that all participating nations agree to follow. At the same time, the legal definition of space is somewhat unclear. Countries often divide regulatory responsibility for all phases of spaceflight over several agencies. And to date, few countries have considered the effects of large constellations of satellites. Instead, they tend to focus on regulating aspects of individual launches and operations in space. The question of which laws apply in space beyond the requirements of the Outer Space Treaty remains unanswered. Because the treaty forbids territorial claims in space, no country's law takes precedence. It is therefore also unclear whether any existing environmental laws govern activities beyond the Earth. Many of those laws were written in an era with limited human presence in space. Most consider the environment to be something specific to the Earth. 
as the line between Earth and space remains somewhat fuzzy, where exactly the jurisdiction of individual countries ends is not known. Environmental laws likely apply to at least the launch and re-entry phases of spaceflight. To the extent that operations in orbit affect the ground, we can look to the model that regulates satellite communications with ground stations. The International Telecommunication Union is a global body tasked with writing the rules. The mission of the ITU is, in part, to ensure rational, equitable, efficient, and economical use of the radio frequency spectrum by all radio communication services, including those using satellite orbits. It works by international agreement, in which countries acknowledge the need for coordination and planning. One goal of the current international space policy framework is ensuring fair access to space. It also aims to limit the harm that space activities cause both in space and on the ground. The mechanism for this in the Outer Space Treaty is its Space Liability Convention. This rule says that when a spacecraft is launched from a country's territory and it damages property, the launching country's government is at fault. Shifting the financial cost of damages to governments incentivizes strong oversight of countries' space activities. This principle conveys a sense of responsibility for the sustainable development of space. But the Liability Convention may not be strong enough to achieve these goals. Despite its nearly half-century existence, the Convention has only been tested once. Its language only considers liability for loss of life, personal injury, or property damage. It does not address non-material losses stemming from activities in space, nor can it effectively safeguard nature itself from harms associated with those activities. Some have therefore questioned whether the Outer Space Treaty is capable of governing uses of space unknown to its framers. One potential impact that large satellite constellations may have is changing the appearance of the night sky. As artificial stars, these lights in the sky compete with the light in the cosmos beyond. That creates tension with certain international agreements that call for a right to starlight. In 1994, the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, held a summit in the Canary Islands. At that meeting, it adopted the La Laguna Declaration. Its Article I asserts a human right to, quote, an uncontaminated and undamaged earth, including pure skies, unquote. A UNESCO declaration on the responsibilities of the present generations towards future generations followed in 1997. It calls on present generations to, quote, take into account possible consequences for future generations of major projects before these are carried out, unquote. It also identifies certain resources as, quote, the common heritage of humankind, unquote. UNESCO extended these ideas to the night sky at another Canary Islands workshop in 2007. The declaration in defense of the night sky and the right to starlight resulted from this meeting. The declaration considers an unpolluted night sky and, quote, inalienable right of humankind, unquote. It also urges nations, quote, to adopt the pertinent standards for preserving the quality of the night sky." Unquote. While satellites' interference with dark and quiet skies was not yet a concern in 2007, the principles remain applicable today. But it remains an open question whether existing legal devices can be applied to space activity impacts on the night sky. There are examples from history we can look at to better understand how the governance of space might work. These lead first to a question. Can anyone own outer space or the night sky? Many scholars believe the answer is no. Instead, space represents what is often referred to as a commons. This is a situation in which many stakeholders hold equal interests in a shared or unowned resource. Examples are resources that groups of people manage for individual and collective benefit. These resources are subject to the consequences of an economic theory called the tragedy of the commons. Such tragedies occur when individual users of a shared resource act according to their own self-interest and against the common good of all users. 
Through their uncoordinated actions, they deplete or foul the resource for the other users. But there are examples of successful cooperation in history that prevented such tragedies. They involve places on Earth that by international agreement are territory of no country, the high seas and the continent of Antarctica. United Nations treaties constitute a set of laws that govern both places. The Outer Space Treaty takes some inspiration from these agreements, but it leaves space vulnerable to exploitation in ways that can irreparably harm some stakeholders, as well as the space environment itself. There are growing calls to make space activities more sustainable. This usually refers to rules intended to prevent collisions between and among space objects. Although orbits are carefully allocated to prevent catastrophes, the presence of space debris makes things unpredictable. Collisions often yield significant debris, and each debris fragment can cause further collisions. Some predict runaway cascades of collisions resulting in what has been termed Kessler syndrome. In this scenario, the rate of new generation debris becomes uncontrollable. It could even render some parts of space unusable because the collision risk is too high. Avoiding this outcome involves two principles. One is called space domain awareness. It aims to understand the orbital characteristics of objects near the Earth and predict their positions in the future. It also couples to the other principle, known as space traffic management. This is a set of best practices and policies that keep space objects separated by safe distances. Space traffic management aims to reduce the risk of collisions which can be especially hazardous. Although orbital space is large, the task is very challenging. Objects move at very high speeds relative to one another. This means they re release tremendous amounts of energy when they collide. These events can pulverize satellites and large debris, threatening all other objects near them. One idea proposed that incentivizes good behavior on the part of space operators is the Space Sustainability Rating. This is a rating system informed by transparent, data-based assessments of the level of sustainability of space missions and operations. Companies launching spacecraft choose to take part in the program. After an assessment of their operations, they receive recommendations for improvements. The improvements aim to reduce the risk of space debris, on-orbit collisions, and unsustainable space operations. The IAU Center for the Protection of the Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference is participating in this process. Its goal is to ensure that the rating includes considering satellite impacts on the night sky. This work involves establishing benchmarks that operators can reference in reducing the brightness of their satellites. Thank you for watching this presentation. For additional information about this and other subjects related to large satellite constellations and their impacts on astronomy and the space environment, contact the center at the address or website shown here.